from the campus and uh, the community. All right. Uh, excellent. So what you're in for if you're a first timer is uh, our crash course series is an hour and a half on something that people in the entrepreneurial community think, man, I'd love to have uh, the key takeaways in this particular area. And in terms of tonight's crash course, this is really a treat to have Brad talking about um, his book, I think for the first time publicly, yeah? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so a couple things before we get going. First of all, uh, I want to say some thank yous. First of all, the students, I, I always feel like there's good karma who are helping as volunteers out in the hallway. They can't hear me. But uh, I want to thank them. Mystery Murphy is here. She's a Silicon Flatirons Fellow, does a ton for our entrepreneurship program. Uh, Cactus is an organizer. And then Jamie and Anna here at Silicon Flatirons. We have an amazing team. There's Cactus back there. Uh, please give a round of applause to the Silicon Flatirons team. <laughs> Second is we have a tradition here to pause for uh, an announcement about upcoming events. Anyone anyway, have uh, plugs for things going on in the entrepreneurial community? They want to raise some awareness on. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, next week, we have CEO for the Slack Weekend. So, any of you know about Slack Weekend before? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so, for all of you who know, it's a free, free day weekend workshop, uh, 24 hour of innovation. You know, we come up with a new tech idea and try to take the idea from the team and working on that, uh, the, uh, the idea for over the weekend, 24 hours. So next Friday, the March 14th to March 16th, that's Spark Boulder, and ticket is about one dollar. But if you use the promotion code Spark, uh, S P A R K, you have a thirty dollar off. So next Friday, we have Tuesday Boulder, so weekend, at Spark Boulder, March 14th. Thank you. Very cool, Danny. Mystery. Hi, I'm Mystery Murphy. Um, I run the New Venture Challenge here on campus, which is the Youth Cross Campus Entrepreneurship Championship. A lot of our participants are in the audience. And we are having our championships on April 22nd in this room. Um, it's an opportunity for you to come and see some of the most innovative ideas that are coming out of uh, CU in Boulder, so student ideas, student companies. Uh, check us out at cunbc.org. It's a good time. Thanks. Hi, I'm Carol Frank. I'm the chair of the CU um, Lake School Youth Council. And on April 4th, we're having our second annual WILD Summit, which stands for Women in Strategy and Leadership Development. And while it's the majority of the people there are women, Thanks, Carol. I'm going to plug one myself, which is next Friday, Silicon Flatirons has its annual entrepreneurship conference. This year's topic, science fiction and entrepreneurship. <laughs> it's going to be a ton of fun. Uh, Will Hurtling is among the science fiction authors that are going to be involved. Uh, Brad is going to be um, among some of the entrepreneurial community that we're bringing uh, to, to the table. And then there's an MIT class on science fiction and entrepreneurship. And the instructors in that class, who are also involved in the Media Lab, are going to be out. So that's next Friday here at 1 PM. Uh, highly recommend. And if you want to uh, register, that's at the Silicon Flatiron site. So before we get going, one thing. I'm just, yep. just curious, how many people here are into science fiction? OK, all of you should come. I think it's going to be a mind-blowing set of discussions. If you don't know William Hurtling, he's awesome. John Undercoffler, who is the science and tech advisor for Minority Report uh, and is a, a CEO of a company I'm an investor in called Oblong, is going to be there. Um, and I've, I've long talked about how science fiction is a very, very important part of entrepreneurial thinking. And what you're seeing a lot more of is what I call near-term science fiction. So science fiction that's within four or five years of now, so you can almost relate to it. And um, Minority Report would be a good example of, of that dynamic. And I think it's pretty bold of Brad uh, uh, Bernthal and, and uh, Silicon Flatirons to take the topic on. So if you're into science fiction, I think it's going to be a really, really interesting one. The only drawback is Brad's now spoiler when they're going to expect books from Will Hurtley when you arrive. <laughs> I'm not sure if we're, we're going to have that. Uh, so one quick thank you, and then I'm going to um, ask you to pause for a second, and then uh, Charlie's going to introduce Brad. Um, you do have books, uh, and in addition to Brad uh, doing this event, it's 
Charlie's entity, Silicon Valley Bank, that has made this possible. So a big, big round of applause to SVB for, for doing that. Very cool. Thanks. Charlie's also a CU alum. Great to have him back here. So I'm going to ask you to pause, reach out, introduce yourself to someone you've not met before tonight, and then Charlie's going to introduce Brad here momentarily. Take a minute. Hey, what's the... Uh It worked. That was impressive. Thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Um, it's great to see such a, an awesome crowd here. It seems like everybody is really eager to, to, to dive in and, and hear Brad's message. As, as Brad Bernthal said, I'm, I'm Charlie from Silicon Valley Bank. Who are we? Well, we're, we're a bank that we like to say we, we work with the cool kids. We work with entrepreneurs, and we've been doing that for, for 30 years. And when Brad called and said, hey, uh, you know, I'm doing this thing with Silicon Flatirons. Can you guys um, buy, some, buy some books for, for everybody? I said, you know, what's the topic? And I'm talking about startup boards. And I said, yes, yes, yes. This is exactly what all my clients need, all the companies I work with, because nothing can take a really, really interesting company, a really great set of entrepreneurs, and just, you know, Put, put them on their put them on their on their heels. Stop them in their tracks. Then a really dysfunctional board, you know things like oh software companies buying real estate and you know arguments amongst boards mem board members. So thank you. And with that, we'll turn it over to a person who needs no introduction in this town. Brad, I look forward to your thanks, package. Charlie. So I really appreciate Charlie and Silicon Valley Bank uh, uh, sponsoring the books. Um, when I do these talks, I really like to have uh, the ability to give away the books rather than uh, I've been to enough things where somebody's sitting out front selling the books. And I feel like you know, the goal is to get the message out there. So I really appreciate the, the support. Um, this is my favorite version of a talk uh, for a book that I've done. And this is my fifth book now. But this is my favorite version of the talk. Does anybody have a guess why? No? It's the first time I'm giving a talk about this book. The, the 200th time I talked about startup communities, I seriously considered, uh, well, I won't say what I consider doing. <laughs> um, but I really like the first time because um, I, I, this is totally extemporaneous. This is not a planned talk. I didn't spend a lot of time thinking about it in advance. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to describe what I'm going to walk through with you, but I'm trying it out on you. So I'm very much looking for feedback. I'm looking for, um, you know, not necessarily real time. It can be, but also bradatfeld.com afterwards. Send me notes with constructive feedback on what would make it more interesting, what would make it more germane um, uh, in general around this topic. Um, how many of you uh, have had a board of directors for a company that you're founder of? Okay. So about a third. And how many of you have had an awesome board of directors? I thought it was just incredible. And how many of you had a shitty board of directors? Okay. All right. Don't, they, they're not here, so you can raise your hand. Um, they might be here. They could be. That's fair. <laughs> fair enough. Okay. Well said. I'm not on your board, Tim. Um, I, uh, uh, I've been on a couple of hundred boards. I don't know how many at this point. And I've been to uh, 
over 10,000 board meetings. And um, about five or six years ago, uh, I, I hit my lifetime supply of board meetings. And more importantly, I hit my lifetime supply of nonsense. And uh, what I realized about five years ago was that the board meeting and the construct of a board was a, a historical artifact. Like so many other things that just keep getting dragged forward. This notion, uh, especially a, a startup board or, or a, a, a venture-backed company board, this notion that you meet every four to six weeks, this notion that the management team spends a day in advance preparing all this stuff and then dragging uh, these directors through while they're peppered with you know, questions, sometimes constructively, sometimes not, but that it's sort of this crutch for the board members to only really engage with the company uh, every four weeks or every six weeks in a proactive way. Now, there's plenty of reactive engagement, but proactive engagement kind of was mind-numbing. I sat in way too many board meetings, or I've sat in way too many board meetings where there was a fundamental conflict that was under the surface, that there was the inability to actually have an understanding of what the different roles of the parties were. Um, passive aggression uh, runs large, ego runs large, smartest guy in the room or gal in the room syndrome runs large. A lack of understanding of the entrepreneur and the leadership team of the company and what they're trying to do in the context of a very, very difficult job, which is creating a company with the dynamic on the other side of the board members, often very much investor-driven board members, behaving in a way that really wasn't helpful to the company. Um, you know, neutral at best uh, to dysfunctional to, in many cases, destructive. So uh, maybe two or three years ago, a guy named Mahendra Ramasaghani, who's the co-author of this book, uh, had read my Venture Deals book. He was uh, in Michigan. Um, Jason Mendelson and I went to Ann Arbor uh, and gave a talk at Ann Arbor about the Venture Deals book. And, and um, Mahendra came up to me afterwards and says, I, I, we should really write a book about boards. And my reaction to that, and I didn't know him. I just met him for the first time. And my reaction to that is, that, that sounds like a really terrible idea. That sounds really dull. Um, and Mahendra pursued me. And... Uh, you know, we got to know each other. He'd written a book about venture capital that my partner Seth Levine and I helped contribute to and edit some and gave him lots of stories about. And our relationship developed over email, and I liked him. You know, he's like one of these guys that was persistent and he was thoughtful and he was making a study of venture capital and entrepreneurship. He was part as a venture capitalist with a very small fund in Michigan, but he was very active in the in the startup community. And uh, he kept pestering me about this notion of writing a book about boards. And I was starting to think of some other books. I was thinking about startup, that would turn into startup communities at the time. Amy and I had, uh, my wife Amy and I had been talking about a book we were going to call Startup Marriage, which ended up being called Startup Life. I think we should have called it Startup Marriage. Um, I think it was a better title. Um, Wiley, the publisher, was insistent that the, that the word marriage could not be in a book that had the word startup in it. And I uh, uh, unfortunately yielded to their uh, insistence, but I, I regret that. I was starting to think about you know, doing some books. And the idea for the Startup Revolution series actually was built around this notion of startup boards. So I said, okay, startup boards will be one of the books, but I need to write a couple more books. What will they be about? For those of you that have followed this series, the first one was communities, the second one was life, boards, and then metrics is, is uh, the last one that I'm writing. And then a fellow named Matt Blumberg, who runs a company called Return Path that has a very large operation here, uh, wrote a book called Startup CEO. So that's the series. I've written five books. This was by far the hardest to write. Um, it was really boring. Like trying to write a book about boards and help understand the pieces of it, but at the same time giving a feeling for what works and what doesn't work, and then coming up with a way to change how boards, how you think about boards or how one thinks about boards is a real challenge. And that's what I set out to do with the book. Uh, over the last two years, I've run a bunch of experiments. Um, I've had some boards where I tried not to have any board meetings um, and instead used a process called continual uh, engagement, 
which even with boards that have board meetings, I now use with all the companies I'm involved in. Talk about that some in the book. Steve Blank, who some of you may know, who is sort of the father of uh, Lean Startup, uh, the original notion of customer-driven development, wrote a couple of really good blog posts about the idea of how stupid boards were in the context of iterative and lean and continual development of a startup. And I spent some time playing around with some of those things. Um, I uh, worked hard to change the relationship of the people on the board uh, for the boards that I was on. So instead of them being investor-driven boards, many of the boards I'm on became outside-driven boards with less investors and more outside directors. Um, I, I settled on some rhythms. For example, I now am very comfortable with the idea of having a quarterly board meeting for every company that I'm involved in. There's no need for a startup to have more than four board meetings a year. However, there's an enormous amount of value for uh, a startup to have continual engagement with its board members on a weekly or every other week basis and sometimes on a daily basis depending on what's going on. So I tried to, in the book, talk about the classical dynamics of boards while at the same time not inventing a bunch of new stuff but taking what worked from my experiments and weaving it in. Uh, the last thing I'll do uh, that I did in the book, which those of you that have read other books by me uh, recognize, is I got a bunch of other people to help write the book. It's a lot easier to write a book if you get other people to write like a third of it. Because then all you have to do is cut and paste their shit and put it in and then edit it. And that's pretty good. And I was really pleased on this particular book with the people who are willing to contribute. Um, for example, uh, there's a section on executive chairman and the role of executive chairman, which I have been. Um, I've also been non-executive chairman of a number of boards. I've been co-chairman of a couple of boards, including some public company ones. And I, I think I actually suck at it. Reid Hoffman, on the other hand, has demonstrated that he's an extraordinary executive chairman. He's executive chairman of LinkedIn. He's the largest uh, shareholder. Uh, and he's um, uh, you know, not a full-time employee of LinkedIn. He's executive chairman. Jeff, Jeff Wiener runs the company as CEO. Reid wrote a really, really thoughtful section about how to be uh, an executive chairman. So you'll have a bunch of those kinds of things sort of woven through the book when you read it. Uh, last comment, and I'm going to practice some, some things on you. I'll describe what I'm going to go through in a bit. Uh, last comment on the book. Um, uh, I, I'm looking, always looking for feedback on the books as well as talks like this. So please feel free after you read the book, if you read the book, I hope you will, um, to send me some feedback, uh, constructive or otherwise. Uh, the one request from every author, has anybody in here ever read any books I've written? A bunch of you. Okay. I have a request, and it's a, retro, it's a uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Not retrospective. It's a request going back in time. Retroactive request. If you like the, this book, Startup Boards, or you've read any other books by me and you like them, put up a review on Amazon or put up a review on Goodreads. It's, it's so helpful. And if you didn't like the book, don't tell anyone. <laughs> OK, so here's what I'm going to do. Um, I, I, uh, I'm going to walk through uh, a bunch of stories. Um, each story, each of these slides is, is a, a chapter title in the book. So there's a, a, a number of slides. I didn't do every single chapter, but almost all of them. Um, I have not thought in advance which story I'm going to tell you uh, for each of these points. So I'm going to tell stories, and I'm going to try to tell stories with real detail. Um, in some cases, I'll anonymize uh, because of you know, either things going on or controversies. But I'm going to try to walk you through a specific example of the, the chapter. I'm not going to dig in and describe what I wrote and sort of walk you through a bunch of bullet points and things like that. So let's try this to see how it works. Again, this is the first time I've ever done it. It might totally suck. So thank you for being an audience. It might be awesome. And I'm looking for feedback on it. If we get halfway through and, and you know, people are like, yeah, this is no good, we'll shift to Q&A and throw it away. And in either case, we've got about an hour. So my plan is for this to take about 30 to 40 minutes or so. And then we'll do Q&A at the end about uh, boards or entrepreneurship or anywhere you guys want to go. Fair enough? OK. Aha. All right. So it's important to define what a board actually is. And in the context of startups, this is often something that's very confusing to people. When you start a company and you're three founders, 
regardless of the type of structure you create, whether it's a C Corp or an LLC or a subchapter S uh, or sole proprietorship, there is still value in having a formal board. It turns out that a lot of entrepreneurs don't create a board until they have to, until a new investor forces them or they do a financing and, and that dynamic comes up. My very, very first angel investment that I made was in a company called NetGenesis. It was done in 1994. Um, uh, I invested $25,000. Uh, in the company, and a guy named Will Herman invested $25,000 in the company. Will, it was also Will's first angel investment. Will and I had been friends for a while. We've ended up doing many, many investments together. It's a company in Boston. It was uh, six MIT uh, undergrads, four of which were graduating. It ended up the formal founding of the company. Two of them dropped out, so the formal found, uh, dropped out of the company. So the formal founding of the company ended up being uh, four people four founders, uh, Will and myself. We put in, uh, each of us put in $25,000, and each of us, each of Will and I got 10% of the company, and the other four founders split up 80% of the company. Um, I was chairman, and on day one, we set up a board. And the board was me, uh, Raj Bhargava, who was one of the co-founders, um, uh, one of the other co-founders, and Will. All four of the co-founders were first-time entrepreneurs. Raj, who is the CEO, who some of you may recognize Raj Bhargava's name. He's currently running a company called Jump Cloud, which we're investors in, and I think it's the eighth or ninth company that he and I have done together. Raj didn't know me. The other founders didn't really know me. But I was putting $25,000 in their company that was just an idea at the time. It was 1994. The Internet and the web are just starting to emerge. NetGenesis was actually started before... Uh, a company called Mosaic, which turned into Netscape. We were started two months before they were. Um, and what Raj was looking for when we created this board, he didn't know what a board was, but what he was looking for was help. So the board at the very beginning, my very first angel investment, the way I got introduced to being on a board uh, of a startup was a young entrepreneur asking me, who was only 28 at the time, but I'd sold my first company and had some success, to help him not to govern him, not to have him report to me, not to be responsible for other shareholders, but to help. And I want to start with that. I want to start this talk with that because fundamentally, your startup board, the people on your startup board, whether they're investors, outside board members, co-founders, their goal should be to help the entrepreneurs, starting with the CEO, extending to the leadership team, to create the company, period. Now, there's a bunch of other things a board does, but that orientation in the context of a startup is critical. How do you create your board? Okay, You've just started your company. You're like Raj. You know, you take the people that are close to you, that are trying to help you, that puts the money in you, or that know you, or that are friends or advisors or whatever. What happens if you've got a company that's two or three years old and you don't have a board? I got a friend in this room. Where, where did Terry go? There's Terry. I'm going to tell the, the story. Can I tell the story of your board? So, uh, how do we meet? We met through YEO? You recruited me to join the YEO chapter. Okay. So, I moved to Boulder in 1995. I didn't know anybody. I knew one person, this guy, Vern Harnish. He moved away three or six months later. Um, I wanted to know some more entrepreneurs. I'd sold my company. I'd moved to Boulder. I was making angel investments at this point. I was flying from the East Coast to the West Coast. Amy and I moved to Boulder. I, for those of you that know the story, I moved here because Amy told me she was moving to Boulder and I could come with her if I wanted to. <laughs> and we were married at the time. Um, so, And uh, I grew up in Dallas. She grew up in Alaska. We lived in Boston. I'd sold my business. I was never in Boston except for on the weekends, and I hated Boston by that point. I, I was in Boston 12 years, which was 11 years and 364 days too many for my tastes. And we'd been here, and we loved it here, just you know, for like a couple of days. And we're like, ah, fuck it. We'll go to Boulder. We'll see what it's like. If we don't like it, we'll keep going west. Uh, and we loved it. And so I wanted to start to find some entrepreneurs. Just I wanted to find my people. And 
Um, I started a chapter of Young Entrepreneurs Organization, and the way I got it started was I asked uh, a lawyer uh, at Crispin Bynum and Johnson, who I got introduced to by a friend, and um, uh, I can't remember who, Tom Bosley from Bank of Boulder, that's right, to send out letters. I basically said, send out letters to anybody that you know that's under 40 that started a company that has more than a million in revenue. That was the qualification for YEO. And so a group got together and we started a YEO chapter and that's how I got to meet Terry. And Terry and his partner at the time, Jim Fudge, had a company that I think was probably about 20 people. It's doing a million and a half, two million dollars of revenue. It was a consulting company. And I remember going for a walk and I don't remember the specific like time frame or anything like that, but I remember going for a walk and you basic, Terry basically said, hey Brad, you know, like I'm, I want to figure out how to get this business to the next level, and it's just me and Jim, and we've got a couple of other people. But you know, can you help somehow? I, I All right, I'm gonna let Terry tell the story. Yeah, you probably said that. <laughs> Why don't you tell the story? This is good. So Terry, Terry, on this walk, uh, I used to go for, I still go for walks, but the walks were often because somebody was going to say something like, "I'm going crazy and I can't do this anymore." And I, I remember saying, "Why, why don't you put together a board?" Why don't we find a couple of other people that have some experience so that it's not just you and talking in your head. And it's not just you and your partner, Jim, talking to each other. And Terry hadn't raised any money. It was a bootstrap company. It was making money. It didn't need any money. But he wanted help. And so what he did was he recruited me. We added a fellow named Bud Sorensen to the board. Bud was a successful entrepreneur who moved to Boulder to be dean of uh, CU Business School, and that lasted about a year before he ejected himself. Um, he's on the, the uh, Whole Foods board and uh, was on a number of public company boards, but also some private company boards. And then um, uh, Bill Payne, who was an angel investor who I knew through the Kauffman Foundation. So creating the board for Terry was interviewing and talking to some people and finding some people through a network, again, back to first principle that could help them. And that could help them as an entrepreneur in the context of, I'm going crazy, this is really stressful, and I've got nobody to talk to, and my wife, you know, Cindy, is sick of hearing me bitch about how miserable things are. And some of it was I need somebody else to bitch to, but some of it was also I need some experienced people that I can talk to, that I can learn from, that can be mentors to me, but that have a stake in it that are not just an informal relationship that I can give a little bit of equity to um, uh, that, that I can build on. Creating a board, and we're going to talk about recruiting in a minute, but creating a board as a functional process in some ways is no different than creating a leadership team. You want to pick the best people you can pick as an entrepreneur to help you. And that board, Terry's board, evolved over the years. Um, I was on the board for a long time. Uh, Bud was on the board till almost the very end of the company. Bill left relatively early, and you had several other board members along the way. A board is not a static thing that lasts forever either. So when you're creating it, just like you think about creating a, a leadership team, you start with what you've got, but be ready to, over time, build and develop it. How does this feel as a flow? Good? Go ahead. Can I just ask a quick question? Sure. Because you said it's not static. Yep. So does that mean that you can almost take over a role? Like you need certain roles to be filled? Yeah. So the idea of specific roles of individual board members, this will vary over the life of your company. At the very beginning of the, your company, you mostly just need trusted mentors, advisors, people that are going to be helpful and support you that are on your team. If I've been, I've been involved as an investor where I've come in to invest in companies that have boards where there's already hostility between the entrepreneur and one of the board members because the board member joined the board thinking that his role and expectation was something different. Or it was an angel investor who had a relatively small amount of equity in the company but was exerting a disproportionate amount of control in the dynamic of the next deal that was happening because he or she wasn't supporting the entrepreneur and what the entrepreneur wanted to do. So that's one dimension of role, right? The role of being helpful and supportive of the entrepreneur, thoughtful. Now, as the companies grow and develop, there are different roles and responsibilities and dynamics. You start looking for different skill sets among your board members. 
you know, if you're uh, an entrepreneur who's really a strong technical entrepreneur, you probably will benefit from having a strong technical entrepreneur on your board, maybe a strong technical entrepreneur who's the CEO, but you'd also probably benefit from having a strong entrepreneur uh, who's got a sales perspective to fill in especially on your blind spots or your gaps. When you start having investors on the board, especially venture capital investors, they basically have one thing they can do. I like to say as, a, as an investor and a board member in a company, there's only one decision I ever make. Do I support the CEO, yes or no? If I support the CEO, I work for him or her, period. I do what they need me to do to help them win. If I don't support the CEO, it's my responsibility to do something about that. And do something about that's on a spectrum. At one end of the spectrum, I can fire the CEO. I usually have that right as a major investor in the company. And as a board, a board can fire a CEO. Not 100% of the time. On the Zynga board, which was a company that I was an early investor in that went public, the entrepreneur who was a very successful entrepreneur, Mark Pincus, had been fired by his previous two boards. So when we funded the company, Mark was insistent that he not be able to be fired by his board. <laughs> and my response was, no problem. I'm putting two million bucks in this first round. Mark, I'm either going to lose my two million bucks or we're going to go have fun together. Like, it didn't bother me that he took that right away from me. I was willing to take that risk because of my relationship with him. I'd known him for a long time, et cetera. But that's pretty much the only role. The other end of the spectrum from fire is get back to a happy place. Right? If I'm not in a happy place with you, it's my responsibility to sit down and talk. If it's a surprise to you that we're not in a happy place, something's even more wrong. And I've had that many times where it's not just been the, OK, it's time to fire the CEO, but it's time to figure out. There are other cases. There's a very public one recently with a company called Moz in Seattle, where Rand Fishkin, who was the CEO, decided he didn't like being CEO of a 150-person company anymore. And he wanted to change roles with his, his number two woman named Sarah Bird, who's now the CEO. And Rand now has an individual contributor role. Or a case locally, a company called Ganip, where Judd Valesky, who was the CEO, and Chris Moody, who was the COO, flipped roles. And Chris became the CEO, and Judd became the CTO. So there's, th those are the dynamics you know, that happen over time that an investor can constructively provide. Um, the one thing I think that entrepreneurs get confused about is they often add board members for Rolodexes. That's the worst reason to add somebody to your board. You can get people's Rolodexes without putting them on your board. Rolodexes often come with a board member, but it's maybe the worst reason. So let's talk about recruiting board members. I talked about the Terry story. Let me talk about uh, another fellow I mentioned earlier, Matt Blumberg, who wrote a book called Startup CEO. If you're interested in this topic, or you're a CEO of a company, I strongly encourage you to grab that book off of, uh, uh, you can get off Amazon. Um, Matt started Return Path in 1999. I invested through a merger of a company I was an investor in called Veripost, local company, in 2000. And today, Return Path is about a $70 million company, maybe a little bit more, about 400 and something employees. My guess is it'll go public uh, in 2015. It's on that trajectory, and we're probably, you know, we're starting to dance with that conversation. The investors, the, the board members today, are myself, Fred Wilson from Union Square Ventures, Greg Sands from Costanoa, <coughs> and a guy named Jeff Epstein, who used to be the CFO at Oracle, um, and he's an outside director. Over the years, I think Matt has probably had another 10 directors. Early on, his original three directors were me, Fred Wilson, and Greg Sands. At the time, I was with Mobius. Fred was with uh, Flatiron Partners, and Greg was with Sutter Hill Ventures, all which were investors in Return Path. So there's been continuity on the investor side, even though the funds that are invested now in the company include Mobius, Foundry, Union Square Ventures, and um, Costanoa, which is Greg's new fund, and we bought out Sutter and JP Morgan. But along the way, he's had uh, board members who include people like Scott Y. Oh, I'm sorry, the other board member is Scott Petrie. Scott was the CEO of Post, or the founder of Postini, which we were investors in, and Google bought for about $650 million in 2007. Scott now runs a company called Authenticate. 
Uh, other board members along the way included a guy named Scott Weiss. Scott is now at Andreessen Horowitz, but he was previously the founder and CEO of a company called Ironport that Cisco bought for about 800 million bucks. Return Path is an email uh, deliverability company. They play a very specific role in the world of email, and they dominate that role that they play. Ironport and Postini were bitter, bitter enemies. They were two companies that did anti-spam and email security using completely different approaches. Postini was cloud-based, Ironport was hardware-based, and they fought brutally in the marketplace. And obviously Cisco buying the hardware company and Google buying the services, uh, 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 SaaS-based company, not a surprise. And at the time, Scott and Scott had huge disdain for each other in the market. They thought the other guy was you know, obnoxious or meek or stupid, or had the wrong strategy, or was a jerk, or whatever. I, I don't even know. But they were really polarized. Um, Matt wanted both of them on his board. And he wanted both of them on his board because he wanted those two different viewpoints because that was his part of his sort of value chain in terms of where he was playing. He had to integrate with the ISPs, the email hosting providers. Whoops email hosting providers, and Postini and Ironport, Cisco and Google were an important part of the ecosystem he was part of. I remember the conversation, he recruited Weiss first. I remember the conversation with Scott Petrie and Scott said, there's no fucking way I'm going on a board with Scott Weiss. Scott Petrie's a mild-mannered guy. Weiss is kind of the bombastic one. And, and Petrie's like, no, no, not interested. Didn't hang the phone up on me, but not interested. I said, come on, Matt's really amazing. You've got to spend some time with him. This will be really interesting. And by the way, I think you'd like Weiss. Yeah, he's a little loud, but I think you like him. And, no, no, I won't do it. I don't want to do it. And Matt, over a six to 12-month period, really just you know, had a couple of meals with, with uh, uh, Petrie and then said, come to a board meeting. I want you to come to a board meeting. I want you to spend some time with Weiss. And you know, S Scott Petrie and I are good friends. And I said, come on, just give it a shot. And he did. And he's like, you know, this is pretty interesting. I could learn a lot from this. I could learn a lot from this guy Weiss. I could learn a lot from being on this board. This will be an interesting board for me. So the recruiting process is no different in some cases than the recruiting process uh, and the wooing process of any other executive. Uh, and I think entrepreneurs miss this. They miss the point that they should shoot high and they should go hard after the people they want on their board. And they should view it Again, it's not a permanent role, right? Weiss got off the board about a year after he joined Andreessen Horowitz. He said, look, I'm, not, I'm a tiny investor in return path. Andreessen Horowitz is not going to invest in return path. I, I only have a finite number of boards I can be on. I can't do this anymore. And, and Matt said, totally get it. Right? Weiss is still a friend of the company. He's still an investor. Um, but that dynamic plays out over time. So treat the recruiting process just like you would uh, any other recruiting process. I'm going to skip this one. Um, so people, raise your hands about the, the people that had crummy boards. What was crummy about your board? Probably the biggest thing, um, we had some dysfunctional members, didn't get along with each other. Um, everybody, I think, believed that they were there to try and help. Yep. So a lot, a lot of questions, a lot of do this, a lot of go check that. Not, not much contribution. Got it. Tim? So at Central, there were just different investors who were against big money models. And so they had different, they had fundamentally foundational interests uh, for what the, what the trajectory and the exit and the other things could look like. And they fought about it. Go ahead. That's bold. Good. Go ahead. One more. Uh, yeah, I had a reverse triangular merger of an ISP that I did about five years ago. I had a couple weeks of the return for the outgoing uh, owner of the business who served on the board for a short period of time. I had one that did well. Got it. So here's, here's the interesting dynamic. Um, if a board is aligned, 
it can be awesome. And if a board isn't aligned, almost by definition, it's going to hurt the progress of the company. Um, the lack of alignment comes in lots of different places. Not knowing what you're doing and as CEO not being clear about what you want to get out of your board as a collective and the individual board members is one. Having venture investors who are operating across purposes, right? The late stage investor who has a huge fund uh, and is just recently invested in the company versus the early stage investors who are in year seven of their fund and are having trouble raising their next fund and need some liquidity and don't have any additional capital put in. That can create some, you know, real misalignment. You know, should you sell the company now? The, the guy who's swinging for the fence is like, no, we're going to take this thing public. And the early people are like, oh, can't, can't we just sell it for a hundred million bucks and make some money? Um, you have the situation where you have an old founder hanging around or even you have a founder, forget about a merger, there's three of you that founded the company, two of you are on the board, but your co-founder is now an individual contributor reporting to the VP of engineering, but he's still on the board, right? And so the dynamic of that interaction, how that plays with the rest of the management team, lots and lots of things around that. There are two really significant things you can do to create alignment on your board. And then there's a third thing which requires um, energy uh, on the part of you, the CEO, but is really worthwhile if you put the energy into it. The two things that create, that can help you with alignment uh, in a really significant way are number one, and it comes back to what you said, it's as CEO, being clear with yourself and with your board how you want the board to operate, what the rules of the road are. And it's not telling the board the rules of the road. The, you know, most board members are not going to say, okay, fine, I got it, I'll just do whatever you say. It's building agreement amongst the board as to how it's going to operate, how it's going to interact, and how it's going to resolve conflict. Interestingly, this becomes uh, a default in a lot of boards, even when they're functional. But if they're not functional, the default simply doesn't work. That's where the second tactic is helpful, which is having a lead director. And I talk about a lead director in the book a lot. I talked about how I don't, I don't think I'm a particularly good chairman, but I think I'm an excellent lead director. The reason I distinguish between the two is the word chair or chairman is a totally loaded phrase in the context of the rest of the company. It somehow implies that the CEO reports to you and you have ultimate authority over everything. And that's a historical dynamic going back a long time. A lead director is the person on the board whose responsibility it is to work with the CEO to help manage the board. And so a lead director can uh, surface conflict, can, can address the issues, is the person who consolidates feedback back to the CEO, is the person the CEO can test things with that they're uncertain about, is the person that the CEO can talk to when, they're have, when there's a problem with a board member or an interaction with a board member, or there's clear misalignment. So those two things are really powerful. First, be clear what you want to get out of your board, and then work with your board to be explicit about it and have them help you define it. Second, explicitly identify a lead director. Often it's one of your investors if you're venture-backed. Often it's the largest one but not always. And there's lots of evolution of lead director. And I'll give an example. In the context of uh, Rally Software, which many of you know, which went public uh, last year, I was on the board from the very beginning. And the board at Rally evolved over time and went from a venture-backed board to an outside director-led board. We didn't have an explicit lead director. Um, but I was probably the most forceful of the directors, and I was probably playing that role in a a sort of proxy role for Tim Miller, who was the CEO. I think Tim would say that if he was standing here. But it wasn't explicit. When we had feedback to give to Tim after the board meeting, we'd have an executive session, I'd be the one that walked back and gave Tim the feedback. When Tim had something he wanted to try out, oftentimes he'd call me to try it out. As we were moving towards the ramp up to a public company board, um, I made it explicit two years before the company went public, about two years before the company went public, that I wasn't going to stay on the board after the IPO. I don't like to be on public company boards. I've done it. Uh, you know, it's not what I enjoy. 
in, in 2001, I was on four public company boards that if you multiplied their stock prices together, you got a smaller number. Any mathematicians in the audience know what that means? Come on, anybody know what that means? Say it louder. Less than a buck. Every, all four companies traded for less than a buck. That really sucked. That was like just a really unhappy point in my life. Um, and, uh, you know, I made it clear to Tim and to, to uh, Ryan Martins, his co-founder, and to Jim Legeal, who's the CFO, uh, still the CFO, you know, look, I'm going to get off the board. Uh, you know, let's make sure we focus on being ahead of this versus what happened with Zynga, which was, for example, even though I made it clear I was getting off the board two months before uh, the company went public, uh, as it was filing one of its almost, you know, pre-roadshow S1s, they realized that the, the independence rules were not being met if I dropped off the board. I was going to drop off in that filing, and then all of a sudden they realized they had a whole independence thing they had to deal with, and then there was this mad scramble to find another board member to replace me, and lots of, please stay on the board past the IPO, and, you know, it worked out, but it was chaos. Again, I wasn't the explicit lead director, but what I started doing was stepping back a little bit. And Tom Bogan, who now is the formal lead director, started taking more responsibility. He was the one that started being the person that took the feedback from everybody back to Tim. And I explicitly would say, hey, Tom, why don't you do that? And he fell into that role because he's lead director on some other boards and he's chairman of some other boards. So it can be not explicit, but I think it's even healthier when it's explicit. The last thing I'd, I'd put on this is that I think boards that do 360s with themselves and with the CEO once a year are excellent. I have very few that do it. I encourage them to do it, but very few. Most, many of the CEOs I work with do a formal 360 you know, for themselves with the board and the leadership team. The couple of cases where the boards have done 360s on each other including anonymous feedback from members of the leadership team and other board members, hugely successful, really powerful in creating alignment. But you, you as a CEO have to decide that that's something you want to do, and you have to have your board be willing to be open and honest with each other. Again, it can be done anonymously, but that's the last step in that path. Is an advisory board useful? How many of you had had advisory boards? How many of you had useful advisory boards? Couple. Um, <clears throat> advisory boards can be useful, but they are not a substitute for a board of directors, and they're a really bad proxy. A lot of early stage companies say, well, I'm not ready to have a formal board yet, so I'm going to have an advisory board, and I get a bunch of names. And what you're doing really with an advisory board often is trying to establish credibility by having some names that you can put on a slide for investors and getting network. <coughs> You know, you get access to their network because they're advisory board members. The problem is it's incredibly low commitment on both sides. And because it's low commitment on both sides, it tends not to be very impactful. So my advice on advisory boards is simply that if you have them, be explicit about what you're trying to do with them. Convene them on a regular basis. Have the advisory board members have some skin in the game. Give them some equity and really focus on a, an engagement cycle that has a tempo to it. You want commitments for a year, but you don't want to default that somebody's on your advisory board for five years, because if I send an email to an advisory board member and that advisory board member says, oh, I haven't heard from them in two years, you just undermine your credibility. So I find advisory boards as a venture investor, I find them to be very ineffective. And again, in the book, we talk some about how to make them more effective. But generally, I say skip it and go straight to having a real board. How many people have, uh, well, a bunch of you have been to board meetings. Um, I'd love two or three examples of what your typical board meetings were. How long, what happened, et cetera. I've been to board meetings that lasted two, three days. Awesome. Yeah. That sounds soul crushing.
three days, um, and I've mentioned, of presentation of really, literally 300 pages of statistics, which nobody is paying any attention to. And it is just, I mean, the, the disconnect from what you're describing and what I see a lot in some of the majority companies, but some of the smaller companies, is a little bit um, sad. Yeah. I think that's one of the reasons we wrote the book was to try to shake that thought up. One other example, and then I'm going to give you my best board meeting, not of a small company, but of a thousand person company that was growing extremely fast. I'm going to describe how that board meeting went. But let's hear another example of board meeting. Go ahead. So two to three hours is the right length for a private company board meeting. Um, socialization around the board meeting is good. If you have a quarterly board meeting, having a dinner the night before, a dinner after is helpful. I think the dinner the night before is probably better than the dinner after. Inviting people from the management team so that it's, there's real socialization between the board and, and the management team. I mean, we're human, so you get that you know, sort of good aspect of it. But three hours is plenty. I mean, I have, you know, larger companies I'm involved in, Return Path, for example, board meetings might last four hours. But there's really no good reason for it to go longer than that. I, I won't go through a slide deck at a board meeting. My best board meetings, and I've done these with companies that are thousand, several thousand people, and I've done these with companies that are three people. One slide, or it doesn't even need to be a slide, write it on the whiteboard up to five topics. The board meeting agenda is deal with the formal stuff. Sometimes that's five minutes, sometimes that's 15 minutes. You know, approve the minutes, approve any stock options, deal with any formal stuff. But do that first. Don't do that as everybody's running out of time and rushing out. Just get it done at the beginning and get it out of the way. If you need to have a discussion about it, have a discussion about it. I'm going to go back to before the board meeting in a sec. Formal stuff. State of the union from the CEO. Can be however long the CEO wants. Could be five minutes, could be 30 minutes. And the rest of the meeting is discussed up to five topics in depth. Now, the only way you can have that board meeting, and by the way, when I say discuss, it's not present, it's discuss. You have a board, it's sitting around a table, people have opinions. As a CEO, you want to get that out. If you have a lead director, you can enlist your lead director to help make sure that everybody's talking. You'll have some people who are good at talking first and some people who hang back, but you want to get the discussion to really be a discussion. Um, the only way you can have that meeting is if you send out the 300 pages uh, at least 48 hours in advance. And they don't have to be 300 pages. I mean, I have, I have board packages that are sometimes 100 pages long, and I have board packages that are 15 pages long. Um, Interestingly, something I've gone to with many of the companies I'm involved in is we do it in Google. It's a Google Doc. It gets sent out a week before the board meeting, and everybody comments in the Google Doc. So you read the Google Doc, you highlight things, ask questions using the comment feature, and people answer. The whole management team sees the questions the board's asking. People can ask questions about whatever they want. You have this interactive dynamic before you show up to sit down and talk about the up to five things that actually matter. And by the way, sometimes it's one thing that you spend the whole time on. That's the best kind of board meeting. Now, in the context of governance, and as I've been involved in some larger private companies or private companies running up to go public, you can't do just that. Right? You have some presentation. Um, that might be one of the topic segments. You have some committee meetings. You separate your comp committee and your audit committee out from the normal board meeting but you still have that as part of a formal thing. And then at the end, so generally I like five to 15 minutes on the front end for people sitting down in their chair, getting comfortable and doing the formal stuff. 15 minutes for State of the Union. Two hours of discussion of up to five topics. So you gotta pay attention. If you have five things you really wanna go through, you got 15 minutes each, uh, or 30 minutes each. You don't have, you know, 
or you know, 15 to 30 minutes from, you don't have an hour for a topic, you're not going to get through five. And then 30 minutes at the end, first, you kick out everybody but the CEO, so board plus CEO. You have a session with just the CEO. Then you kick out the CEO and it's board only. And then the lead director goes back and shares whatever came out of that with the CEO. And sometimes you have nothing to talk about, so they can be short, but you do it every time so that when you have something to talk about, you don't have this weird, awkward moment where you have to kick out management team and then kick out the CEO. And I say kick out because it's kind of fun with a flourish as a board to say, all right, you're out of here now. We're going to talk about you. Because that's what you're doing. But that's a natural part of the board rhythm in the context of trying to make sure you're understanding what's going on. Yep. They stay in the room with the CEO. So the session with the CEO is board plus CEO. CEOs are usually on the board too, but it's just board members at that point. And by the way, um, a lot of VCs will bring their junior people to the board, or you'll have somebody on the board that's an observer role. Um, it always makes me smile when in that session, that's the board only session, uh, the CEO kicks out the observers and says only people on the board in this session. Now, there's, a, there's cases where you don't do that. You're happy to have the observers in the room. But there is something different about the formality of the board having a little bit of time to now have that formal time together in this otherwise reasonably informal setting where you're working together so that if there are substantive issues that you have to confront as a board, there's a chance for them to come up. The last comment I'd say on this is the board meeting should happen in the board meeting. How many of you have had board meetings happen after the board meeting? <laughs> or before the board meeting, or around the board meeting? Right? The reason you send the board material out before the board meeting is so that everybody can get up to speed, they can get engaged with what's going on. You know, I, if I'm continually engaged with the company, the board package isn't much new information for me, but there might be some directors who aren't as engaged. That's okay. They don't have an excuse a week before if you send them out a full board package and say, read it and comment on it. And people do. It's interesting. Even the, you know, the, the directors who you, you know, are the least emotionally engaged in what's going on, when they show up at the board meeting and there's no PowerPoint and there's no turning pages and there's no discussing that stuff and you just launch into the topics, well, they're, they have a really uncomfortable board meeting, but the next time they read that shit. <laughs> I'm going to skip this because I want to make sure we spend enough Q&A. All right, this is, this is uh, along the tone of what we're talking about, uh, which is managing ongoing expectations. I, I like the... Eugene did the slide, so that's Eugene's Dilbert. That's, Eugene works with me as my assistant, and so you know, I'm constantly telling him. Uh, I, I, I would show up in the morning and i say, you're fired. Uh, no, not today you're not. Okay, how you feel? <sighs> Better. <laughs> um, this is the thing that I think CEOs blow. CEOs are afraid to tell their investors and their outside board members what they expect of them. If you don't tell me what you expect of me and then hold me accountable for it, I respect you less. I don't understand how you're going to do that for your leadership team. Bart Lorang, who CEO of Full Contact, hates when people are late. Hates it. Makes them batshit. I am always late. <laughs> I'm not that late. I used to be a lot late. <laughs> Terry probably remembers me showing up like an hour and a half late to something. I'm like five minutes late or ten minutes late. How many of you are 24 fans? It's pretty awesome that Jack Bauer can get anywhere in Los Angeles in two minutes, isn't it? <laughs> awesome. I, I have that, believe I have that skill. I can get to Denver, I can leave my house at 15 minutes till, and I'm in downtown Denver parked and at my meeting at 15 minutes later. No, never happens. In rush hour traffic, I can do that. Um, managing the expectation is important. Bart said, I'm going to start the board meeting at 10 a.m. Every board meeting starts at 10 a.m. If you are late, you are late. It is starting at 10 a.m. So the first board meeting that I showed up to at 10.14, I was 14 minutes into the board meeting. They'd already voted on all the options, and I didn't have a say in that because everybody else was there. And 
Bart didn't even introduce me as I walked into the whole management team who was showing stuff. He just ignored me for a while until, you know, it was appropriate. He was pissed. I was 14 minutes late. The next board meeting, I was only three minutes late. I had an excuse. And one of the other board members the night before told him he wasn't coming to the board meeting. And so Bart was really aggravated. And you could see it. The next board meeting, I was at 945. I knew that it was important to him. It was important to him for him, for the team. It was a show of respect for the process. That mattered to him. There are other people who don't care, but he communicated that clearly. That's a reasonably trivial thing, right? Like start on time, be on time. Like it's a thing. It's not like a broad, whatever your expectation is. I expect that when I reach out to you as a CEO that you respond to me within 24 hours. I expect that if you have any issues with my performance or anything I'm doing, you confront me with it transparently and directly. I expect that I can talk to you about any topic that's bothering me in the context of the business, and you will listen to me and not judge me and try to help me. That's pretty soft, mushy stuff, but it's important. And setting those expectations, not with the board as a collective, but with the individual board members, is something I think CEOs miss over and over again. One thing on financings, and then I'm going to do open Q&A for the rest. Um, your board is incredibly important in the context of your financing. This is one of the places where people get at cross purposes. Investors in different series or different fund life. If you're angel back now raising venture. If you've got a VC who wasn't the original VC that made the deal because he left his firm, which is usually a euphemism for his firm, fired him, and somebody else inherited the company, and you're not doing that well, but they're not that emotionally involved in what's going on. You're having trouble getting a financing done, and one of the firms decides to behave in an opportunistic way um, and make you an offer, but at a low price that's not really fair relative to where you are, but they're not helping you get a financing done. Uh, board members and outside directors that have different points of view, oftentimes you see a lot of conflict around that. Uh, CEOs who have fantasies about what the financing is going to be like, and so instead of leveraging uh, the investor group that they've got to help them with the financing, they polarize that dynamic around the financing. So all of that on the front end. The financing could be equity or debt. You know, when Charlie and SVB does a financing in a company, they call the board members. They call the investor board members and say, what are you thinking? And my guess is it happens more often than not that you call two different investors and you get two different stories. You probably get that one investor who tells you like the truth and the other investor who says, they're doing awesome, it's great, it's fabulous, wonderful, whatever. And then you get the measured response from the other guy and you calibrate. That doesn't help the company when there's not a sense of realism on the part of the investors. Or if one of your investors has a reputation of being a promoter and all he's doing is promoting deals. Um, there's a, a VC who has a reputation, I won't name the person obviously, but has a reputation that basically anybody that he reaches out to about a deal immediately passes. And he's an okay investor, he's not a terrible investor, but he's terrible in the context of referrals to other VCs. He's got a few that I'll pay attention to him, but he thinks that he's well respected in a market that doesn't actually really respect him that much. So understanding where you are and understanding the reputations of your investors, understanding the alignment dynamics, and then being formal about it. Right? Financings are formal things. The board should support the investment. You'll often have situations where investors in your company don't play their cards and tell you what they're going to invest until after something shows up, and then there's plenty of wrestling over it. How many of you ever heard uh, one of your investors say, I'm going to take off my investor hat now and put on my board member hat? Or I'm going to take off my board member hat and put my investor hat on? Anybody ever hear that? No? Yeah. It's bullshit. If you're, a bo if you're a board member, you have a fiduciary responsibility to the company. And if you're an investor, you have a fiduciary responsibility to your investors. You cannot take off one of those hats. You got them both on your head. And you got to make decisions in the context of them both on your head. 
So as an entrepreneur, when you're in a financing, and again, there's lots of stuff in the book about conflicts and stuff you have to go through, recognize that your directors often have that conflict. How many of you have ever had a director who was put on the board by one of your investors? Did you trust that person to be an independent thinker separate from the director, from the investor? No, where was their loyalty? Was their loyalty to you or to the VC that put them on the board? Now, that's interesting. Their loyalty should be to the company. Oftentimes in a financing, it's not. Now, that's not illegal. I mean, I guess you could get into legal trouble with it. It's hard, but you should know what you're dealing with as a CEO. Okay, I want to stop because we have about 15 minutes left. Um, one question, um, uh, everybody close their eyes. Uh, honest response, uh, I'm going to ask you awesome, mediocre, bad for this approach. Recognizing that I didn't I had too many slides and I'm making up stories and figuring it out, okay? Bad. Mediocre. Awesome. Great. Two thirds, two thirds awesome, one third mediocre. So all of you that said mediocre, my request, do it if you want. It's super helpful to me if you send me an email, bradatfeld.com, and tell me what could have been better. Doesn't have to be a long email, it can be bullet points, it can be a sentence. That'd be really helpful. All right, before we do q and I have one more thing for you. In the Jobsian reveal of one more, just one more thing. I gave you a book. Charlie sponsored it. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Foundry Group started, my partners and I started a, a publishing company. We're publishing books ourselves called FG Press. You can go to fgpress.com and see what we're doing. We're doing fiction, nonfiction, science fiction, uh, and professional development around entrepreneurship, technology, and innovation. Uh, we, we launched a publishing company last week. We published our first book yesterday. It's a book called Uncommon Stock. It's by a 25-year-old first-time writer named Elliot Pepper. It's in a category that I like to call startup fiction. So think of what John Grisham did to legal fiction. We're doing to startup fiction. Now, most companies have a lot of fiction in them. Right? And often, fiction imitates life and life imitates fiction. Uh, this book's based in Boulder, Colorado. It's two undergraduates, uh, Mara uh, and um, uh, James. They're best friends since they were kids. Uh, Mara has a boyfriend. They start a company. Mara's the CEO. They, they get into some trouble pretty early on with some shady characters, and it goes uh, kind of crazy from there. Um, if you send an email, uh, today to uncommonstock at fgpress.com, we will send you a free copy of the book. Uh, you know, ebook version. It's a $5 book. Feel free to buy it if you want, also. Um, and uh, again, remember, if you read it and you like it, put up a review on Amazon, or if you have a blog, write about it. And if you don't like it, don't tell anybody. Um, but uh, it's a fun one. We really love doing it, and it's a good local boulder. Uh, there's lots of good local boulder color in it. All right, let's do some Q&A before we end up. Go ahead. Brad, how about uh, compensation, particularly for outside directors? Yep, somebody asked me that as we were coming in. So uh, generally speaking, um, uh, you should cover, for the private company, cover expenses. So if somebody has to fly to a board meeting, cover their expenses. Uh, you should allow them to invest in the, in the current or previous round any amount they want. So if, so if a director joins and wants to invest $25,000 or $50,000 or $100,000 in the company, Generally speaking, I, I like to let them invest. As a venture investor, I'm happy for them to invest in that round or if there's a round that's happening when they join the board. And then the last is a good metric is to give them somewhere between 25% and 50% of what you'd give a VP level person. So if you would give a VP level person at the time stage of your company 1%, uh, then somewhere between 0.25 and 0.5% vesting over four years. So, you know, if it's 0.5, it's 0.125 a year. You give them a 0.5% grant, that's over four years. The one difference between director grants and employee grants, oftentimes with employee grants, you don't have any acceleration on change of control or 
you know, you have what's called double trigger, which is there's only acceleration if they get fired after the transaction or don't go with the transaction. Uh, most directors you give single trigger acceleration to. So if you get bought in year two, it would be as though they earned all four years of their options because obviously there's no director uh, afterwards. But that's, pre that's pretty typical sort of compensation range. Uh, public company, and even in public companies, most public companies directors take stock instead of, for, for emerging public companies, uh, stock comp instead of cash comp. Um, some people pay cash comp in public companies. For private company, I, there's no reason to pay any cash compensation, ever. Just, you know, if your directors are not happy to take stock, they shouldn't be a director. Oh, I, I thought it did, but I'll describe it again. Um, uh, uh, we walk in the board meeting. Again, get the package in advance. Very, very detailed. A thousand person, probably company was, I mean, I, this came from Zynga, so my experience with Zynga. So even at a thousand people, they were probably a $250 million a year business, maybe $200 million a year business, growing really, really fast. And um, we got the board package in advance, all the data we'd ever want. Coming to the board meeting, and, you know, Mark, Mark always had, like, some food because there was always, Zynga always had a, they had, like, a cafeteria, you know, kitchen. They always had food on staff, a Silicon Valley kind of thing. Uh, and Mark, you know, we'd always just have, like, a, a wall of food, and then there'd be a whiteboard. And in Mark's uh, scrawl on the whiteboard would be a couple of bullet points, and that was the board meeting. That was it. And we talked, you know, and... And I, I think we rarely talked more than three hours. We were all pretty worn out after three hours of, of talking. And, and sometimes the conversations were really intense, and sometimes they were, you know, Mark in his head as a CEO, crazy. And sometimes they were like a real strategic issue that we had to hammer through. Now, not every board meeting was like that. We do an acquisition, this big acquisition. We get everybody on a conference call. We go through some formality. We have you know, the end of year audit cycle, comp cycle things. I mean, we have some formalities around it, but those formalities tended to be out of cycle with these substantive board meetings where everybody was deeply engaged in what was going on. Go ahead. Yep. Sure. 360 review is if you take a person and organization, you get feedback from people that are, they report to, that report to them, and are their peers. Okay, so you know, this notion of a 360 review. For a board member, it would be your other board members, the CEO, and people on the leadership team that have exposure to you. Uh, for the CEO, it would be the board members uh, and the people on, on his or her leadership team. The really good 360s are ones where the data is quantitative and qualitative. It's anonymously collected and then fed back publicly to everybody. So, you know, you can sometimes get the nuance of something from what somebody says or where conflict is, but there's usually enough feedback where there's patterns and whoever is curating the feedback coming back is anonymizing it if it's really obvious, you know, that there's a particular piece of conflict coming. Go ahead. Can you talk a little bit about um, when it's suggested that early founders share a board member seat when they're bringing on investment and it's like, oh, investors take one and then yeah. the founders share a seat? So it, it depends a little bit on the, 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 the structure of the company and the founders and the dynamics between the founders and the experience level. Um, I would say most boards of companies that scale up tend to trend to a place where there's only the the uh, founder CEO on the board, and if there's other founders on the boards, there are financing rounds where eventually those founders drop off the boards. Um, the exception is when there's a hired CEO that, and the founder is still on the board either because they left, but they're still a major shareholder, or they take a different role like CTO and they represent kind of the founders on the board because the CEO, even if they're not, you know, whether they're hired or not, is all, almost always on the board. It's unusual for there to be more than two members of management on a board at scale. But often when you're young, you might have three, right, especially if there's three founders. I like to set the expectation when I make the investment, uh, you know, because we're pretty early investors, 
that the board's going to evolve over time. I don't really care at the beginning that there's two founders on the board. If those two founders are kind of of equal stature in the business, it doesn't matter that that continues for a while. What often happens is one become one is the CEO, and that person tends to have a different relationship with the board than the other. And it makes more sense for that other founder to be an observer, to participate in the board meetings, but not be formally on the board. And I'd rather have a board, my personal best boards are the ones that have an even, even number of outside directors as VCs, and then one management team member who's the CEO, who could be the founder, but is the CEO. Those are the best boards. Um, I also like boards that have more outside directors than VCs. The boards I don't like are the ones that have more VCs than outside directors. Because then you have a VC-driven board, and that rarely has good balance across the whole system. The punchline on that is, at the beginning, it's not that important. You're collecting talent at the beginning. But as you get to a point where your company is now 30, 40, 50 people, you've raised more money, it's getting bigger, that configuration matters. And as the, the, the founder or the CEO, being thoughtful about that configuration and making sure that there's a balance in the conversation is really useful. Can you talk a little more, bit more about the numbers of board members at each stage? Sure. Um, very early boards, often three, four people. Um, I've been on some boards with two. Two people is kind of an uninspired board. You're just talking to each other. Um, it happens, but it's not that very inspired. Three people is kind of the minimum. But lots of early boards have three or four. Um, uh, I'm an investor in a company called Cato. went through Techstars last year. We're the lead investor. They raised a million and a half bucks. The board is the two founders, me and Luke Beatty, who was the managing director of Techstars Boulder last year, who's now at AOL. He plays the role of an outside director. Um, I'm on other boards where there's, uh, there's three people at that stage. And I'm on some early stage boards where there might be five people. I would then say most boards as they start to ramp up are five to seven. Um, I think more than five for a while is pretty unwieldy. And what happens oftentimes, the reason you end up with more than five is because each VC is asking for a seat and each founder keeps a seat and all of a sudden you have seven people on the board. And that's just hard to manage. So the idea that with each subsequent financing, you're rethinking who is on the board and trying to manage it you know, to that five to seven range. And by the way, a lot of people have an aversity to an even number of board members. I couldn't care less. I can't think of a single case of a board I've ever been on where you had a deadlocked vote. You either have a unanimous vote or it doesn't happen. One person objecting to a vote often means that you need to have a bunch more conversation about it. Um, I've been in some really heinous situations and real conflict situations between investors and uh, uh, entrepreneurs. Um, the board vote is not the thing that counts in that situation. It ends up being the protective provisions and the financing documents and who has what power and who can do what to whom. It's very interesting. When it really, really, really gets bad, the board is not the... The board is not the, the ultimate governor, um, uh, especially if your company needs more money, because then the really bad behavior comes out you know, from the investors, um, especially if they're angry or they feel deceived or, they f or they're just bad people. Yeah, it varies a lot. Um, uh, I think that if a CEO is spending more than uh, 5 to 10% of his, his or her time managing the board, uh, that CEO has not done a good job of expectation setting. That does not mean that the CEO only interacts with board members that much, right? Um, I think, you know, the, the best companies I'm involved in, the best CEOs are ones who... Um, I probably have periods of time where I'll have very infrequent interaction outside the board meeting, you know, email stuff back and forth, and then other situations where I talk to them every day because something's going on. So it really depends on what's going on in the business and what phase you're in and what they need from you at that moment in time. Um, but the managing of the board, right? Once a month we have a board meeting. I have to spend a day before the board meeting uh, with my management team putting together the board package I have to then spend the board meeting 
going through the board package. I have a board who just says, asks me a bunch of questions and tells me to do a bunch of shit. And then after the board meeting, I have to do another day's worth of a bunch of shit that the board told me to do. That's three days of, not out of 30, out of 20, of work. Forget managing. That's work. That's way too much. By the way, that's the default for a lot of historical boards. Go ahead, in the front. Uh, the boards that you're on, what's your biggest fear? Biggest fear of the boards I'm on? Yeah. That I will become bored. It's <laughs> probably my biggest fear. Um, I, I'm not hesitant about, about shaking it up if I think there's bad behavior. I'm forceful with my point of view. I take a, you know, I take a position. Um, I've been on boards that were just incredibly complacent, that really didn't, you know, challenge what was going on, um, where, you know, it was very disconnected from what was happening in the business. So for me, like, th that's bad. Like, I don't want to be involved in that. Um, I guess the other thing is, you know, when things are going good, it's great, it's easy, whatever. When things, when the shit hits the fan, which it always does in companies, I mean, every great company I've been in has had multiple near-death experiences. It's just how it works. And you have these moments that are just dark. And, and the, you know, however dark it is for me as a, as a board member is trivial compared to how dark it is for the poor CEO. You know the metaphor, the, I, I wrote a blog post about this, the duo the other day. Think about the Mr. and Mrs. Smith movie. How many people remember that movie? Or just think about any, uh, any movie that has a, a male, female, two protagonists that like near the end of the movie they're in a fight. And they're almost invariably today with all CGI and stuff, they're like back to back spinning around in circles and flipping over each other with guns blazing, you know, killing like 50 of the enemy while the two of them blow their way out of a bad situation, right? That was the, 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 the Home Depot scene or the, the, the hardware store scene for Mr. and Mrs. Smith. That's what you want when the shit hits the fan from your board. You want to circle up and you want to deal with the shit together. You don't want the, you fucked up or you should have or this. You just want everybody to form a tight circle back to back and go deal with the problem. And sometimes deal with the problem is one day, and sometimes it's a month, and sometimes it's longer. But that's what you want versus everybody sort of sitting around saying, well, you know, it's kind of fucked up. But here's a couple of things to go do to maybe fix it. All right, so that's what I worry the most about is that you'll have a dynamic in terms of the board. That's the thing I like the least, I guess. You, have that you see that dynamic. Um, but that's it. Not much else scares me. I mean, the, the stuff I've been in, again, 10,000 board meetings. You, you name a situation, I've probably encountered it. Um, you know, the first, time, the first time I got sued as a director uh, was incredibly uncomfortable. Um, you know, it's a process. It's a stupid process. You know, lawyers suck. Oh, wait, where am I? <laughs> Go ahead, next question. Um, Brad, I'm coaching a... a a VC, uh, CEO of a 120 person company. He has a VC controlled board. And every time he brings discussions to them, they judge him for not having a really good sense of where to take the company. And so he's gone to presentation mode, trying to prove himself. Oh. Any ideas how he could get out of that? Does he have any outside directors? Uh, two. Are they any good? Don't know. They're probably not. So what he needs is a strong outside director who will kick the VC's butt. Right? If he's got multiple VCs, that strong outside director needs to stand up for him, number one. Number two, he should sit down one-on-one -on -one with each director and say, this is what's going on. Every time I bring you an issue, I'm looking for feedback. All right, I'm looking for help. I'm bringing it to you in my thought process. This is how I think. You're judging me. That doesn't help me. You know. He needs to have those conversations. If he can't have those conversations with the VC directors, he won't make any progress. So it's those two things, right? It comes back to the setting expectation. He, him defaulting into presentation mode, it's just going to get worse, right? So he's just going down a, a, a path that's going to end, you know, probably not good or will be ineffective, right? He's not going to get much out of it. So then he's wasting 10% of his time as CEO and he's wasting the talent around the board table. Those would be the two things I'd do. Um, 
can I ask one, one more follow up? So I talked to one of the board members the other day, uh, VC backed, but really nice guy. And he basically was saying that in his role as a board member, he feels like he's less effective as, at giving advice. He's much better when he's not on the role of the board. So Tom, got off the board. Well, he, he did, but <laughs> any, any thoughts about why that is? Because he's, he probably sucks as a board member. I don't understand that. Anybody who says, I don't feel like I can be effective giving advice and feedback as a board member, why, why would he be on the board? That sounds terrible. He's probably afraid of these people, not so, and that's a big problem. Well, no, this is the VC is saying yeah, that. The VC guy. He's a senior VC guy. Sure. Is, is, this, is this VC a senior guy? Is he well respected? Yeah, he has 100, 100 companies <laughs> that, he's, that he's invested in over time. Give him a copy of my book. <laughs> I mean, I don't know who it is. If you tell me who it is, I'll tell you what's wrong with them. But uh, <laughs> my reaction to that is that, that sounds crazy, right? Sounds crazy. Sounds like a cop out is what it sounds like. All right, uh, two more questions. This side. Let's do a couple over here because I've been. My right foot sticks out. My, my trainer says every time I stand, like I, I'm a big runner, and I must have a little bit of asymmetry where I start leaning this way. So I'll lean this way. Tim, and then these two guys. So three. Boom, boom, boom. So one, I mean, one, of the things you're, one of the things that last question was sort of about was, and, and one of the things I think you're saying is you want to promote conflict in the board meeting, right? You want to promote discussion, yep. where, whereas there are, there are people who believe Right, that it's the job of the CEO to come in and have all of the all the answers and right and just sort of run through it. So it sounds like what you need to really do is establish up front the expectation, which is we're here to have conflict. We're here to have debate. We're here because debate helps me. Right. And I would be yes with one nuance is I would be thoughtful about the words I use. Right? Conflict versus debate. There, one's loaded and one's not, right? Discussion, uh, you know, I'm bringing hypotheses to you and I'm looking for your feedback on my hypotheses, frames it very clearly. This is a hypothesis. This is not a decision that I've made. Here's my support for my hypothesis. Pick it apart, right? Now, if your board meetings are only that and that's all they ever are, and the hypothesis that you put forward are consistently idiotic and your support for your hypotheses are lame, over time your investors or board members will get tired of engaging in that dynamic. If they're well thought out, if they're well supported, if they have controversy and if you pull out of that discussion different points of view and then close the loop on the other side, which is, you know, a week later or the next day, okay, here's what I heard. I have, a, I have a board member, Raj does this. After every board meeting, he sends out an email of the main things he heard under each of the things. Now, there, you know, it's not a tedious, you know, like report card check-in. He's telling, here's what I got, here's what I heard, and here's what my conclusion was. To give us one more chance to say, nope, 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 you heard me wrong. Or, oops, I didn't think about that. Or that conclusion doesn't make sense. So this is the other part of it. It's not just that in the moment thing. Right? It's part of this continuity of engagement between the board members and directors. But yes, coming back to the thing you said at the beginning, Tim's absolutely correct. It's what we talked about earlier. Setting the expectation that this is not me reporting to you. This is us trying to solve some contemporary problems in the company. Right. So my question. Um, oh, that wasn't the question. No, it, it wasn't. Um, but, but it's related. No, go ahead. You, you've probably read Death by Meeting, right? Yeah. So, so it sounds like one of your core messages is the same message as Death by Meeting, which, which is that, that a really engaging meeting, right, is one where there's preparation on, on important topics and where there's considerable, you know, the meeting, the book calls it conflict. Yep. You, you call it debate or, right, whatever, where, where, where there's that expectation, which then turns it into a great meeting. Yep. Okay. Correct. And by the way, I'm not saying don't use the word conflict. I'm saying use the word that fits with your culture. Okay, Bart Lorang would use the word conflict, for those of you that know Bart. Right? That's his style. Um, Raj Bhargava would not use the word conflict. He would use the word discussion. So uh, for a startup that is uh, just about to get the product ready or launch, when is a good time to look at forming the board? I, 
I say it in the book. I, I think you should, start, you should start the process of forming the board when you start the company. I don't think you should wait for a particular time. I think a board, a great board can really, really help a company. A crummy board can destroy a company. And so as the entrepreneur building the muscle and the skill set of having a board from the very beginning and having that wired into your business from the very beginning is incredibly useful. Now, the companies, for example, that go through Techstars, they generally don't have a board when they go through Techstars, but many of them form a board coming out of Techstars. A lot of them raise their first round of financing. One of the mentors joins the board. Like, that's the kind of time, you know, at the beginning of the business. When you're serious, this is what you're doing now full time. If you're part time, you're still at some other company and you're playing around with a new idea. Now, you're not, you're not for real yet. When you're all in, when this is the thing you're doing, view the board um, as, as an extension of what you're doing. I have a phrase, every great entrepreneur continually collects people. Okay? For everybody in this room that's an entrepreneur, your first and foremost role on this planet is to collect people. <laughs> that's what yes. you do. Collect people. Boards, yeah, I'm flattered that you want me to be on your board. Like It's an easy way for you to start to collect people where you're punching above your weight where you collect people that can help get you to another level well before you're at that level. Co collect people, but build that into you from the very beginning. Last one. Okay, so with the, uh, uh, what about diversity of outside directors? Should you stay in the space that you're operating in? We're a startup. Does, should we be looking at people that, are, that, that understand that space yeah. or look for diversity? It varies a lot by what the CEO wants. It's fascinating. I, um, I think every CEO of a company should be an outside director on another company. So within the 60 or so companies that we have at Foundry Group, not all of them, but many of them are directors on other companies. Some are directors on other companies we funded, and some are on other companies totally separate. Some are on companies that have some relationship to them, some are on completely different. I'm not sure it matters that much that direction. So it's really what the CEO wants. Does the CEO want people that fill in their weaknesses? Does the CEO want somebody who's going to bring a totally different way of thinking about it? I'm an investor in a company. It's a very rapidly growing company. Hasn't raised a lot of money. Doesn't really want to raise a lot of money. Um, and they added a, uh, an experienced entrepreneur um, who had done a few uh, uh, big private equity funded businesses, big fundraises, very like a totally different frame of reference to give that balance, to make sure, you know, I had my point of view about their funding strategy. Their investors, other investors had a point of view that was reasonably consistent. They had a point of view that was a little different. And then this other guy has a completely different point of view. Right, so I think it's a good mix. You want, you know, diversity is a powerful statement, whether it's diversity of thought, diversity of gender, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of experience. You want diversity. You as CEO should define the kind of diversity and the dimensions you want. And again, it's the default into, oh, that person's available, I want them on my board because they've got a good Rolodex and a good reputation, they're gonna look good on my website. That's a shitty reason, right? Collect people. What is this person going to do that's going to help me and my business? Are they going to emotionally engage in it? Do they really want to be part of it? And, you know, get that. How is this going to help me continue to drive forward? The, the person who says, I can help better if I'm not a director. You don't want them on your board. Let them help you without being on the board. Right? So I, I don't think that there's like a pat answer to it. I think it's from your frame of reference what helps you do the most. Last question. So um, I've tried lots and lots and lots of different things. The thing I find the most effective is, um, uh, for me, and I think it's different from director to director, but for me, uh, I consciously think on a weekly basis about every company I'm involved in. So I have different ways of doing that. For most of the companies I'm involved in, I get a daily email from them automatically that has, I call them the three magic numbers. And the three magic numbers are your three magic numbers. Every company has different ones. Sometimes it's five. It doesn't have to be three. It's kind of like the Monty Python skit. Um, and, you know, when it becomes nine, I, say, I send the email back to CEO saying, three, 
<laughs> Get rid of some of these. I don't want all this. I want that email a little bit to see the numbers. They're usually a sale number, engagement number, revenue number, you know, some number that's metrics in the business that are real metrics. I get that email more to prompt me to think about that company every day. Less because I care about the number. I just want it to enter my mind for a little bit and me think, do I need to do anything here today? Then in some of the companies, I'm on some of the email lists. For example, in a company where there's a product cycle where the company really wants me involved in product, put me on the product list. Or you know, if you're doing everything through GitHub, put me in the GitHub repo and let me just see what's going on. It, again, it, it's not that I necessarily process it and study it. It just makes me think about it a little bit more. The next is I have a rule which is every exec in a company Basically, every employee of a company should feel free to reach out to me about anything, but every exec should, with the understanding that whatever interaction we have, um, I'm going to close the loop with the CEO publicly with them, unless they say to me, this is confidential, I need to talk to you about the CEO, in which case I'm still going to close the loop with the CEO, but I'm not going to do it without the interaction with them first and thinking carefully about it and how best to do that. Um, and so what happens is, in different companies, in different places, I tend to get sucked into different things. And I work for the CEO, right? So the continual involvement and continual engagement is this rhythm of me doing work for the company rather than managing or judging or governing what's going on. And I think, you know, again, I, I have a couple of other techniques like that, but those are the biggest. Um, which is really just to get into the meat of a thing and then stay involved in the meat of a thing. CEO says, I'm having real trouble with my engineering organization. I can't figure out da 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 da. I don't say, here's your answer, and I don't point at a website. I say, well, I'll come and spend a half a day with you and the VP of engineering and let's talk about how it's structured because I don't have any idea how it's structured anymore. And, you know, well, well, uh, I think he'll be a little intimidated by that. Well, he shouldn't be. Tell him that I've been a CTO of a public company before, and you know I'm going to help him figure it out. And oh, by the way, you don't need to tell him that. I'll reach out to him, right? And the CEO says that's great. And I reach out to the VP of engineering. And say, look, I got you know you scaled a lot. It feels you know I talked to the CEO and he feels a little uncomfortable. And I'd love to just come and sit and spend a day and talk to some of the guys and talk to you and understand what's going on. I'll give you feedback. And my goal is not to judge. I'm just giving you feedback. Is that helpful to you? And I'll tell you every single thing that I get from it. That would be incredibly helpful. Right? That's continual engagement versus it's a board meeting, VP of engineering, here's the structure, slide, slide, slide. We're thinking about doing this, slide, slide, slide. You know, do you approve? Yes, no. What is that? Useless. All right. Email address if you want a really great piece of fiction. I promise it will keep you up all night. I won't promise that. Um, I think it will, though. Thank you for doing this, Charlie, especially. Thanks for the books. <laughs> Remember two things. Feedback, especially those of you that thought the first 45 minutes was mediocre. Um, and uh, uh, if you like the book, make noise about it. Thanks.